to get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Samantha Betcher. I'm a student at Pima Community College and one of your hosts and moderators for the evening. Um, just a heads up, again, if you have to use the restrooms, um, they're located through the main entrance to the left of the front desk. If you have any questions, um, please ask a member of the floor team. And floor team, if you could raise your hand so everybody knows where you are. Thank you. Well, we would like to welcome you all tonight to this forum, where we hope to familiarize you with two valued candidates that are currently running for District 5 seat on the Board of Governors. The third candidate, Dr. Sayed, declined our invitation. And we would also like to express our thanks to the El Rio Learning Center staff and students who allowed the forum to be held here, um, as well as the League of Women Voters, the Intercampus Council, and our sponsors, the Adult Basic Education Civics and, uh, and Student Leadership Program. Um, finally, I would also like to express our gratitude for these candidates who have taken their time out of their busy schedules to be here with us tonight. So this, part of it, uh, this forum is part of our ongoing voter education efforts to help voters make informed decisions um, at the upcoming elections that will impact not only our school, but our entire community. We hope that over the course of this program, you will learn more about the candidates and what they hope to accomplish should they be voted on the Board of Governors. Uh, we would also like to add a little bit about ourselves in hopes that you understand where we are coming from and why we feel tonight's event is so important. So I am currently in my second year of FEMA and I'm majoring in business marketing and communications and my plans are to transfer to Eller next year. I'm active in PCC's Intercampus Council, the All College Council, the Strategic Planning Committee, as well as our Honors Club, Phi Theta Kappa, um, which is a national honors organization, as well, oh, I lost my spot, sorry. Oh, um, and various outreach projects. As well as being a student, I also work as a marketing coordinator for two local companies that also have a heart for community. And after falling in love with Pima Community College and realizing how vital of a stepping stone it is to those in our community, I cannot stress enough the importance of those to whom we interest in future. Now I'd like to introduce my fellow moderator, Anna, who will share <coughs> her story and begin further explanation in tonight's events. As you can tell, I'm very short. <laughs> thank you, Samantha. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, candidates, for being here in this forum, and thank you, all of you, for being in this forum tonight. My name is Ana Chavarin, and I am a single mom and a GED graduate. I am also an ambassador for adult education, and I am currently taking classes at Pima, and this year, I was nominated to represent students in the Pima College Intercampus Council. In addition to being a student, I am also work two part-time jobs. I am a student leadership council facilitator at the Pueblo Adult Learning Center and also a community organizer for Pima County Interfaith Council. My goals are to obtain a PhD in clinical psychology and to improve my community through organizing. Moving along, I will start this evening by explaining some procedures for the forum, which candidates receive ahead of time. Candidates. You will have two minutes for an opening statement and one minute for a closing statement, 75 seconds to answer each question except the first three questions for which you have 90 seconds. There will be no rebuttal time as this is not a debate. Opening and closing statements will be shared by candidates by name in rotating alphabetical order. The timekeeper is sitting in the first row when there is a half a minute left in your speaking time, the timekeeper will hold up a card that says 30 seconds, <laughs> indicating that you have 30 seconds to finish your answer. Please wrap up when you see the stop card. If you continue speaking after the stop card is held up, then one of us will say thank you <laughs> and move on to the next speaker. Personal references about other candidates or racist, sexist, or any other offensive comments are out of order will not be tolerated. Please uh, note the camera in the side of the room. This, is, um, this forum is being recorded at length and will only be used by us for observing purposes. Instructions for the audience. Please put your cell phones on silent. If you have a call and it's an emergency, please step outside quietly and take your call. 
We request that you treat all candidates fairly and with respect. Please remain quiet throughout the forum. Absolutely no clapping, cheering, or calling out, with the exception that after the opening and closing statements. You may clap for all the candidates if you wish at this time. No campaign literature, signs, accessories, or apparel are allowed inside this room. All right, so the first three questions have been previously collected and approved by students. The remaining time will be questions collected from students who participated in the Intercampus Council Forum this past Tuesday and also from the audience. You're encouraged to submit questions for the candidates on the, uh, on the approved and provided index cards and questions must be addressed to all candidates, must apply to issues or qualifications for their particular office. Um, please raise your hand if you'd like another index card or you have um, or you would like to have your question collected. A volunteering unbiased screener will review the questions for legibility, clarity, and applicability to all candidates and their potential role on the governing board. We will use as many questions as time allows, sometimes combining similar questions, uh, striving to cover it, to cover a variety of topics as well. Um, if you don't hear your particular question, it could be combined with other similar questions. And if candidates so choose, they will be available following the forum to talk. The candidates are Martha Durkin and Luis Gonzalez. And now we'll, um, we'll begin with opening statements. Uh, please, Mrs. Durkin. Is your time. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank the hosts of this event, the students from Adult Education, Civics, and Student Leadership Program, the Intercampus Council, and the League of Women Voters. And I want to thank all of you for caring about this election and the issues that are before us. I want to tell you about myself tonight. I'm going to give you some background information, and I'm hoping that through the answers to the questions, you'll get to know just not about me, but who I am. So as an attorney and in high-level administrative positions, I have worked for the city, the county, and TUSD for the last 30 years. I um, served actually in the city manager's office and as the interim city manager for one year. Throughout my career, I have been responsible for large budgets, the largest being $1.3 billion. I've um, been the head of several departments. I've worked in areas of internal audit, compliance, uh, contracts, HR, and I've represented appointed and elected boards. In August of 2015, I was appointed to fill the District 5 vacancy on the Pima Community College Governing Board. This appointment followed a competitive application and interview process held by the County Superintendent of Schools. And it was there that I presented my experience and my credentials, and I promised to work to make Pima an open admissions college, to make student success a top priority, and to remove barriers to higher education. I believe in these principles because education is the great equalizer. When we remove barriers to education, we offer people a pathway out of poverty and a second chance. I joined the Pima College Board in the midst of its multi-year plan to address the accreditation issues that remained when the probation was lifted, to expand career and technical curriculum, and to develop centers of excellence. My extensive public service, particularly my legal background, has brought enormous value to this board as we address this <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll answer the questions and go on. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to first uh, thank uh, sponsors for sponsoring this forum. Uh, I'll be a little bit late in the game. Uh, I think it's very important uh, that we have these types of forums. I've lived in Tucson, Arizona, all of my life. 
I've been involved in community events, community, um, just about everything you can think of. Even this place here, uh, I was one of those individuals who fought hard to make sure that this center could be built uh, back in the mid-60s. I served in the Arizona State Legislature in the Arizona State Senate for eight years. I sat on the Education Committee for eight of those years that I was there. So I'm very familiar uh, with the process in the legislature and how the funding uh, occurs for community colleges and other public uh, educational institutions. I was very much uh, involved in funding of adult basic education when I was in the legislature. So I'm very familiar with that. I've been a city manager for two separate small cities in the state of Arizona. So I know how to balance budgets. I know how to read a ledger. And I can, uh, I can tell you where some of the skeletons can be buried. So um, I'm pretty good at that and I'm very proud of it. I work for Indian Nations and executive director positions uh, where I've had uh, the opportunity to work with a number of uh, people, in some cases uh, 20 employees to 2,500 employees in the uh, gaming industry. And I've been involved in this community for the last community for the last 40 years. I didn't come here from anywhere else. I know exactly where we're at. I know the communities. And I believe that Pima Community College is the single most important educational institution in Southern Arizona. And I want to see it prosper, I want to see it move forward, and I want to see it get off of unnoticed, which is this right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Now we will move on to the question and answer portion of our forum. You have 90 seconds to answer these first three questions. And the first question is, how would you get local, state, and federal policymakers to give college more money? And um, okay, thank you. And I'm going to try and talk fast. I um, these are kind of long questions, but we do we do get funding from the federal government quite a bit. Um, there is an initiative from the Obama administration for a tuition-free community college, and I would support that um, by lobbying with our congressional delegation. The state of Arizona, however, has eliminated all funding for Maricopa and Pima colleges. And so that's been a problem for the college. And we are addressing that by trying to raise funds locally and increase our enrollment. But we would like to go back to the state. And in my opinion, the best way to do that is to tie our request for funding to a career technical program that enhances economic development in Pima County and in the state of Arizona. I think with that approach, we will get that funding back. And finally, our local funding comes primarily from your property tax levy. Um, and the board can, can, is in charge of that and increases it by up to 2% a year. As well, we do have tuition. We have um, the investment from our partners. And we have our foundation that collects um, money on behalf of Pima Community College. So um, what I want to stress with the students is that you are uh, key ambassadors in this area. Our elected officials listen to you, and you can help us regain the state funding and increase our federal funding. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. The question is- Mr. Uh, Gonzalez, can I ask you just a little bit? Please put it a little bit farther, because it echoes when you speak, and it's hard to okay. hear. Let's keep it a little lower. You're not going to talk about time yesterday. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, is this better? A little farther. How about that? That's better. Okay. okay. The question is how do you try and get more money uh, into the community college uh, system? Uh, what my opponent just described is the way the schools are funded now. Uh, so she didn't really answer the question. Uh, one of the things that, that we need to do to increase funding at the college, Pima Community College, is to enter into more public-private partnerships that will bring in more revenue uh, into the coffers. We also need to advocate the state policymakers to reinstate the $7 million that they took away from us last year. 
Now that's a, a pretty difficult thing to do, uh, but if you know the process of how the legislature works and operates, uh, I think your chances of doing that are a lot better. So, and I know that process, I've worked that process in the past, and I still have a lot of contacts in the legislature that I uh, would work very hard to try and bring some of that money back. And lastly, I think that both the state and at the federal levels would really need to work hard and lobby to get more money into the, into the community college system, not only here in Pima County, but across the country. Uh, and yes, there, are, there is some talk about free tuitions, but don't hold your breath on that one, guys. Uh, but we ought to work hard on it, uh, see if we can make that happen. Thank you both for your input. I appreciate it. The second question, what are your thoughts on textbook requirements so that students don't have to buy textbooks that are never used or can't get a refund for it if class gets canceled? Mr. Gonzalez, you can go first. Thank you. Can you repeat the question again? Yes. What are your thoughts on textbook requirements so that students don't have to buy textbooks that are never used or can't get a refund for it if class gets canceled? This is a more complicated issue than it appears to be uh, when you read it out. But as I look at this particular question, I think there are four areas of concern. Uh, one is that if, in fact, the bookstore is not refunding books, the cost of books, if there's a canceled, if there's a canceled class, then maybe the college needs to go and negotiate or renegotiate their contracts to make sure that there are buybacks on these, uh, on these books so that the students aren't penalized and they may be penalized uh, at this time. Secondly, the student needs to, to be clearly notified from the very beginning not to buy a textbook until after they're in the classroom and receive a syllabus from the instructor. At that point then, uh, they can buy the book. And thirdly, you know, if a class is canceled or a book is not used that the, that, that, that the student buys, uh, then something is definitely wrong here because that's a contract between the student and the college. And if uh, that's the case, then that contract is breached and the college should be liable for paying back whatever that book cost. So we need to do that. And the last part is, uh, yes, I am in favor of it, but I think we need to be very, very careful that at the same time, we do not infringe on the freedom of the, of the faculty who has to do their own syllabus, their own curriculum, and they're the ones that have the ability to do the classroom instruction and the pedagogies that they employ. Thank you. Thank you. I, I too, understood the question maybe a little bit differently than what, what you gave us than what you read, but, um, and the refund issue should be addressed by the college. But in principle, I support a common textbook requirement for the reasons that the students indicated. Um, this allows uh, the same textbooks to be used across different campuses for the same course, um, and it allows the students to be able to buy and sell their textbooks um, more easily. And then by doing that, removes a barrier for them in terms of cost. But that said, we do need to have um, room for differences in teaching style, and we need to protect academic freedom. So there are times when we would allow different textbooks to be used, even in the same course. What I would propose is when that occurs, that the college have a policy for open source materials. These materials are available online instead of in print. They don't require the purchase of textbooks, and it would give the faculty flexibility in, in being able to offer these supplementary, supplementary materials. The Pima College students brought forth a proposal for open source materials to the board and to faculty. It was very well received. 
and in fact, the college got a grant to implement that program. I would like to see a similar proposal on the use of common textbooks. Okay. Thank you, Candida, for your responses. And we have a third question, and the question is, do you support fully reinstating financial aid's ability to benefit ATV for all students, even those without a high school diploma or equ equivalency? Why or why not? And we will start with Mr. Gonzalez. You know, th this issue here uh, over the years, uh, ATV has been eroded and diminished uh, by the bureaucratic rulemaking of the bureaucracy in the federal government. The Educational uh, re uh, Reauthorization Act will be coming up in a couple of years, and we need to look at that. We need to lobby to make sure that we reinstate ATB back into the process. I fully support funding for reinstating uh, financial aid because the ability to, to benefit for all students, even those students who are who are not uh, having finished high school or an equivalency. Uh, so we really do need uh, need to do that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as I say, the rules and regulations have been eroded from, from, from uh, for a long period of time. Uh, and today, uh, that's the end result. So we need to get busy. Uh, make sure that the National Association of Community Colleges is on board and then they go and do the lobby that needs to be done in order to change that and bring it back. Yes, I also support the much more expansive ability to benefit rule. Prior to 2012, students without a high school diploma or equivalent were able to access financial aid as long as they were able to establish college readiness. The ability to benefit provision, the ATB, was eliminated in 2012 by the Federal Congress, but reinstated in 2015 in a much more restrictive manner. Now I read the law and, and even as a lawyer I found it very cumbersome. The, the new restrictions required that the student be on an eligible career pathway and that the college readiness be established via certain exams approved by the federal government. So I would also, I support going back to the more expansive rule and allowing a determination of college readiness by the local entity. And I think that again, our students, and again, our best ambassadors, our elected officials listen to you, should join us in Washington, D.C. and, and block for this provision. Thank you. And now we will uh, take the questions from, from the floor. <clears throat> okay. How do you feel about PCC's decision to increase local students' tuition and decrease international student tuition? I believe you went first last time, correct? You did? Okay, thank you. Yes, the board this year did decide to increase the in-state uh, tuition, and that decision was made after research was presented to um, show us what would be accomplished by increasing that tuition and where we would be in the market, particularly in the state of Arizona and among all of our community colleges. So part of our mission is that we provide affordable education. And it was with that mission in mind that the board did approve the increase, making the finding that it was still affordable. In other words, the typical financial aid package covers it, and that there were other uh, measures in place for those not eligible for the financial aid. We're still in the lower one-third of community colleges in the state with regard to cost, and one-tenth the cost of the U of A. So the decision to also to decrease the out-of-state tuition and online was made based on the market. It is still full cost recovery for these students. None of the in-state tuition is used to cover the cost for those students. But we need more of them because that increases our enrollment. And with increased enrollment, we have increased funding. 
and there will be there won't be a need to have to increase in-state tuition in the future. Thank you. I am totally opposed to increasing tuition fees for students. Ms. Durkin voted to increase local increasing of, of fees, not only once, but twice. And I will tell you this, in those two votes, one was voting directly for it, the second vote was to, was to vote for the budget that had it in it. Now, in that vote, it also had another provision, and that provision was to decrease fees for foreign students. Now, what are the priorities? Let me tell you something, I never would have taken that vote. Never. My vote would have been looking at that budget, finding out where the holes are, where we're heavy, and moving money to make sure that our students were not going to be punished for decisions that the board has made in the past or decisions that the legislature has made in the past by taking money. And consequently, we wouldn't have done that. But it doesn't make a whole doesn't make any sense to increase local tuition fees and then decrease it for wealthy foreign students from China and the Middle East. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, no, sorry. Please follow the rules. Um, I have a second question. Over 750,000 was given to the International Students Program with thousands of dollars for trips abroad. Would you support the same sort of allocation for recruiting from our state's Native American nations? And um, Mr. Gonzalez, I think you go first this time. No, I would not. Let me just say this. $750,000 of that money came out of the general budget. It didn't come out from foundations, it didn't come from anywhere else. $750,000 that could have been used to not raise tuition fees for local students. One other thing, when you use monies like that and you speculate that you're going to get revenue from foreign students, that's pretty risky. When you have the experience that I have in working budgets and doing budgets, you don't fund programs speculatively in the hopes that you get a little bit of money in the process. I think that was the wrong thing to do, and I think we need to go back and redo it. Find a way to fund uh, international studies. I'm not opposed to international studies, but I think we need to find a different way to fund it. was given to the International Students Program with thousands of dollars for trips abroad. Would you support the same sort of allocation for, for recruiting from our state's Native American nations? Okay. Well, I definitely support allocating funding for recruiting students. And I would definitely support recruiting students from our the nation's um, the Native, Native American nations in the state of Arizona? That is, an, an answer is yes. But I also support our global education program because I believe a part of the college experience, experience is learning with and from people who are different from us. And like it or not, we live in a global economy and to prepare our students to be successful in this economy, we need to provide access to different cultures, and we need to be able to have uh, students from different cultures study here and send our students to study internationally. Thank you both. The next question, is there any way for PCC to get a contract with Suntran for reduced bus fare for students and faculty like how the U of A and some high schools have? It's your turn. 
Yes, there is. <laughs> there, you could do an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Tucson, um, and you could have, uh, the Pima College could have that. Um, I don't uh, know why not, apart from the fact that Pima College is not directly on the streetcar line. And the streetcar line um, was partially, um, actually there was a lot of assistance from the U of A in exchange for offering those kinds of prices to their students. Um, but Pima Community College should be more assertive in um, seeking that kind of assistance or providing assistance with transportation for our students. So I think that's a, a very good point and something I'm happy to look into. There's no question about it. Uh, governments do these things all the time. Uh, they enter into IGAs on a number of things. Uh, so there isn't any reason why Pima Community College couldn't enter into an IGA, an intergovernmental agreement with Suntran, which is basically part of the city of Tucson. Uh, so I think that should be done. Uh, I think that uh, the college should uh, begin uh, negotiating for, for that kind of an agreement. And I think it would be a great help for students uh, in need, particularly uh, the low-income students. Uh, let me just go back. I have a little bit of time and, and uh, add a little bit to the last question that I, I didn't uh, address. And that is the issue of Native American recruitment. Uh, we have uh, in Pima College a situation where there is very little recruitment going on in Native American nations. Uh, I worked with Native Americans for the last 20 years. Uh, and I understand uh, the cultures, I understand uh, what goes on in, in, uh, in those communities. Uh, and I think it would, would be very well served to go out and do recruitment uh, on Indian reservations. Uh, as opposed to recruiting internationally outside of the country. Thank you. And I have one more question here. On September 14, the PCC board extended Lee Lambert's contract for another year with a salary of almost 300000 Do you endorse 100% of everything Mr. Lambert has done? Mr. Gonzalez, it's your turn to go first. Well, I wasn't there voting on that uh, contract, but I will tell you this, uh, I read it very carefully, not his contract, but I read the motion very carefully, uh, and I would not do that in that order. Uh, basically, a contract is supposed to be evaluated, and then after you evaluate it, uh, then you decide whether you're going to extend the contract and give a person a raise. Uh, in this case, they did it in reverse. Uh, first, they extended the contract and gave him a raise. And then, in the next meeting, they did the evaluation. Now, if you were in business and did that, uh, you know, somebody would be having your head pretty quick. So the answer to that is, is no, I, I wouldn't do it that way at all. Uh, now, he may be worth $300,000 or so, I don't know. But it seems pretty extreme to me. Thank you. 